Hello and welcome to Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by patrons Liam Johnson, Matthew Jacob, Stephanie Franz, and Stuart Plemons. Thanks, guys. I'm Matt Enlow. And I'm Oren Kaplan, and today we have Natalie Metzger on the podcast. She is a producer that we have been trying to get on forever because she's produced so many things that we are very excited about and has produced for so many previous guests of ours. She produced the movie Greener Grass that premiered at Sundance this year, directed by Jocelyn and Don, who were on the podcast. She did Thunder Road, the feature, and she's producing another movie for Jim Cummings right now and producing another movie with Josh Rubin, Josh Rubin, another previous guest. And every movie she produces is like really cool and interesting Super and good. unique. Yeah. Yeah. Natalie's like the thumb of the infinity gauntlet. She's like the final gem in the like vanishing angle lineup. Nothing. Right. Vanishing Wolf. angle being the production company that she works with. <laughs> right. For listeners. Yep. yep. <laughs> and then is the thumb gem. Is that a, which gem is that? Do you know? Uh, I don't remember which one that is. And actually, I guess there's the one in the middle of the hand, the back of the hand as well. Right. Cause there it's six stones. Oh, there's six gems. Yeah. Yeah. That's a perfect segue into something I wanted to talk to you about, Matt. Which is, have you read the Martin Scorsese article Oh, that uh, he wrote for the New York Times about the reaction to his comment? So Martin Scorsese said that Marvel movies aren't cinema. mm -hmm. And people were up in arms about it. Yeah. Uh, Well, like the rest of the internet, I haven't uh, read that article, but I do have plenty of opinions. Okay. Well, (laughs) uh, Uh, no, I I don't actually have. I I think actually that he's pretty reasoned in terms of like where he's coming from. And also, you know, that's not where everyone else is coming from. Right. So he wrote this article. It's pretty short. I recommend reading it. He wrote it for the New York Times. And he talks about what he meant when he said that. Mm -hmm. And of course, he kind of explained that he doesn't think that the filmmakers that make Marvel movies are not talented at all. He thinks they're all great and there's a Mm -hmm. a lot of amazing filmmakers making Marvel movies. So Scorsese said that when he was becoming a filmmaker, what excited him about filmmaking, what excited him about Hitchcock and about all the filmmakers Mm -hmm. that were big around his time. But also he talked about Ari Aster and he talked about Wes Anderson and P.T. Anderson and a few other directors that are making movies now. He's like, "The, the reason movies excited my friends and me is because we would go to the movies and we wouldn't know what to expect you know Mm -hmm. people were taking giant giant risks and they would make stories that might connect with people might not connect with people they would try to be experimental they would Mm -hmm. try to Mm -hmm. show emotions in a new way they would try to show all these various things in new ways and to him a marvel movie is like the exact opposite of risk taking sure let me ask you this, Oren. Have you seen Hugo? His movie? Mm-hmm. The 3D movie? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It's like so predictable, right? Like, I, I don't, it, this isn't a, an occasion to shit on Martin Scorsese because he's done <laughs> plenty, plenty of great movies. But like, I, I get that point 100%. And also, if you do enough work, you're going to fall into some cliches and be a little more predictable than you want to be, right? Yeah, but maybe Scorsese doesn't think of Hugo as his most cinematic of movies. Also. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. But yeah. like if you think about Taxi Driver or Raging Bull. Sure. Or, you know, even even like Wolf of Wall Street and stuff like or um, The Aviator, like he takes he just seems to dig deep in ways that you aren't necessarily expecting and you don't know what's going to happen next. And I don't know, it made me think like, you know, I've always I've been the one on this podcast that's always like the one that wants to direct a Marvel movie. But when he references someone like an Ari Aster mm-hmm. or P.T. Anderson, and you do think about the movies they make and the way they make you feel, and you might hate their movies, you know, or they might do nothing for you, it might be overhyped or whatever, but they're still causing conversation in a way that the Marvel movies don't. I mean, the Marvel movies cause yeah. conversation, it's, but it's more, I don't know, I, I guess I just felt like I really understood where he was coming from, and it made me want to make stuff. Well, you sent me a short film today that like a script, Mm -hmm. right, of a short that you want to make. And it's like kind of out of left field in this crazy way. And I think that's like reading an article from Scorsese about how Marvel movies are so predictable makes me more encouraging of you making that. 
I, I, I remind you of Scorsese all the time. You're always saying that <laughs> off mic. You're just like, you call me Marty half the time. It's almost embarrassing. Um, yeah, thank you. That's nice, nice of you to hear, or nice of me, nice of you to say. <laughs> and good for me to hear, I suppose. Yeah, I, you know, so it makes me think of the summer after my first year of film school, I went back home and I worked at the Hollywood Video, which was the video store that I worked in in high school as well. And this was, you know, that, that freshman year, I lived on the cinema floor. I met like people, a ton of people that I'm still good friends with to this day who had very, very different eclectic taste. You know, I knew a guy who loved Jackie Chan and Godzilla movies obsessively. And then also a dude who owned every single Criterion edition DVD and they lived next door to each other. You know what I mean? It was like a, that kind of ideal sort of film school eye opening experience. Right. Right. And then that summer I went back and worked at the video store with my highfalutin taste now. And I would like had was veering much more into the, like artsier stuff and more esoteric stuff than I was the more populist. And that summer, I just remember realizing very clearly after I'd recommended movies that I really, really loved to people and they were dissatisfied. You know, they, it wasn't what they were looking for. Right. Like true foe for like the yeah. family, the family mean, that comes in. I wasn't that daft, but I did, I did have some big misses. You know, I feel like I remember pushing the Royal Tenenbaums pretty hard, which, you know, I love. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is classic film school idiocy. That summer I just realized like, you know, people watch movies for all sorts of different reasons. And the lady who rented Save the Last Dance every single day for an entire summer mm -hmm. liked watching Save the Last Dance over and over <laughs> and over again. You know, right. to me, like, yes, I understand that like a person could could love cinema with their whole heart and also not connect to those Marvel movies. I've seen every single one of those movies and sometimes they're super duper boring to me and sometimes I'm in awe of the incredible cinematic feat of creating a 20 movie arc that is daring and exciting to me. Do you know what I mean? And so, yes. and some look, did we all know exactly how Endgame was going to go down? Yeah, sure. Of course. But like, that's different than calling something cinema or not. And frankly, it doesn't, I think it's just like an embarrassing argument to have. Like I, I want to have more, interesting cinema for sure like if everything was just junk food over and over and over again that would be a problem but like i like cheetos and i also like you know fancy salads i spent too much money on i i still would love to direct a marvel movie sure uh, yeah uh i would love to direct a marvel tv show i'd like to love to direct a short commercial featuring a marvel <laughs> superhero sure but that said i think there is some value in thinking about how the work you're doing, how it makes people feel and how it's unique and how it is trying to use the medium in a way that it hasn't mm -hmm. been used before. Like, who's the guy that did The Witch that now has the Lighthouse movie? Robert Eggers. But, you know, the fact that he made this, like, four by three black and white film that people are saying is very interesting. You know, like, in 2019 is super cool. And I don't think you get to make the Marvel movie until you've made Brick or you've made even Chronicle or some movie that nowadays seems like so cliche, but when it was made, it's, it was like unique and special. Exciting. And so, yeah. yeah, I think that that's the thing that it kind of reawakened in me is like, it's like, why am I trying to make stuff that feels like a short Marvel movie? You know, mm -hmm. I should make something that feels like nothing you've seen before, but is still telling a story and hopefully emotionally resonant in some way. Well, when you always said that you wanted to direct a Marvel movie, I never thought that you literally meant that you grew up loving Thor and wanted to make a Thor movie or something. I thought you always just were like, I want to make like a a fun, big budget, star studded PG-13 action movie with some comedic element. Yeah. And that's I just think, like... I think what... that's an accurate reception. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it's like there's a big spread between Black Panther and Thor Ragnarok, right? I think that's the fun of like the way that those movies are working or like Spider-Verse yeah, or whatever, or, right? Yeah, Logan to Spider-Verse, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's just like you just want to be playing in the studio system and the that's what those that's what they're making right now, basically. Yeah, but I'm super, I have not seen Jojo Rabbit or Parasite yet, but I'm like super, just as excited to go watch those movies as... Uh, yeah. There actually is, isn't yeah. a Marvel movie I'm super excited for right now. Sure. Well, I mean, after 20 movies, I think they, they did it.
I'm yeah. <laughs> I don't know that I, I'll ever um be excited to go to another one. You know, I think we maybe even talked about this on the show. I'm very excited about this movie season because you know, we we've, we've had Marvel movies for so long, right? Mhm. I think there's a Star Wars one coming out, right? Yeah, and we've got Star Wars is is at winding down. So like the big so Star Wars is, will be done, Marvel movies will be done. And I know they they've got another phase or whatever, but like I doubt people are going to be as excited as like this 20 movie lead up, right? Like that's it. Right. And then I feel like there was another big franchise that oh, Game of Thrones is over, right? And so to me, I'm hoping that this is the end of one era that style of filmmaking and that you know i don't think it's a coincidence it's early in the year for us to be talking about awards movies right like that people are talking about parasite or the farewell or you know the lighthouse this early on feels yeah even hustlers yeah yeah exactly exactly those were all we're naming movies that people cared about that they were interested in that they watched along with those other movies and also are, they're excited about them. So I think like now that we're running out of like blockbuster IP, you know, I think we're going to see a new era of smaller mid budget movies again. I hope we'll see. Yeah. With all that said, can you guess which movie I'm most excited for in November? I, I don't know. And probably Star Wars. I don't know what. No. What? Frozen 2. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm so excited to take my yeah, sure. daughter to go see it. And it's like everyone in the family is like, hey, can I take Winter to see Frozen like, 2? And I'm like, no nope. way. You can get in line. Yeah. Wait, has she seen a movie in the movie theaters yet? Yeah, she saw okay. Toy Story yeah. 4, which I, I didn't think was like the perfect movie to see in a movie. Did she care her. about the other Toy Story movies? Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. My, my first was Follow That Bird, which was the first Sesame Street movie and was a mm, phenomenon. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know what my first movie in the theater was. I did watch a lot of, I think I watched all, like all the Ninja Turtles yeah, movies yeah. in the movie theater. But cool. Well, speaking of awesome movies that are kind of breaking barriers and new ground, let's talk to Natalie Metzger, who has so much good information. I mean, there's so there's like two or three amazing takeaways that I got from this that I was not expecting. Speaking of awesome kind of groundbreaking films, I'm excited for you all to hear our interview with Natalie Metzger. But before we jump into that, we want to tell you real quick about our Patreon. Check it out at patreon.com slash just shoot it pod. And Patreon is a way that if you like the podcast, if you feel like you're getting something out of it, you want to support us, give us a dollar a month, anything. It's super helpful. It helps us pay for our server space and our live events and all the things. And speaking of live events, if you are a patron on our Patreon, then you get into our live events for free, which means free food, free drinks, free everything, uh, pretty much pays for itself. Yeah. So if you gave $1 a month and came to two events, you would be in the red. Or did you know this? In the black? In the black, in the black. Yeah, yeah. Did you know that we just hit the $300 mark? Oh, on Patreon? It's our first threshold. That's our first goal. Originally, oh. that number was designed to mean that our editor jay and back then it was chris and jay that we would break even with paying them but we have since given our editors a race and so <laughs> that is not the case um no but it's still cool yeah. and it's what's cool is also that it's you know from a, a bunch of different people so it's exciting so yeah so check out patreon.com slash just shoot it pod and otherwise let's get on with the show We're here with Natalie Metzger, and we're going to give you all the secrets of how to get your film made. Hopefully. When are they? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Natalie, uh, I feel like uh, avid listeners will have heard your name many times. You produced Greener Grass and Thunder Road. Um, and you're on a, like a real hot Oh, and right she now. did Little Dickie's Fre- Freaky Friday, which oh! was one of my unpaid endorsements. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was a fun one. So uh, we're so excited to have you on the show finally. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, you were saying before we started that uh, you're just about to start another new movie. Yeah. So we're in post-production on Jim's uh, Jim Cummings' second feature, The Werewolf. Um, and then we are... Uh, in pre-production for his third feature, The Beta Test, which we're shooting in two weeks. It's funny, you don't look 
utterly exhausted <laughs> because also greener grass is going into wider release as well right yeah so uh, greener grass released this past week so we were doing screenings and q a's and press and then we're um expanding beyond new york and la um this coming week um i'm i'm very excited that you don't think i look exhausted yesterday i got to the office at 4 a.m and oh. didn't leave until like 9 p.m well but... maybe, maybe a little tired <laughs> why would you go into the office at 4 a.m um because we're shooting in two weeks <laughs> And we've been in post-production on this other movie. And so, uh, you know, it's like ramping up for this new thing as, you know, we just got studio approval for Picture Lock on The Werewolf. So oh, like right. once we got that, it was like um, full force. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I'm curious, you know, you guys have done such an inspiring and great job at like being utterly independent, right? Like Thunder Road was distributed solely through your company, right? Self-distributed. Is there a studio for this this movie? Like you said, there was a studio lock, et cetera. Like, can you talk about that deal at all? Um, yeah. So uh, I, I can probably talk about it. It'll probably be announced before you guys put it live, but just in case it isn't, just FYI. Um, but uh, yeah, we're doing that. We're partnering with um, MGM's Orion oh, cool. um, for The Werewolf. Awesome. And so, um, yeah, they're the distributor behind it and um, funded the thing. And um, yeah, it's been a really great partnership with them. That's exciting. I think uh, Night Owls was distributed by Orion as well. Yeah, so they so they essentially it had you know kind of fallen by the wayside, and they mm. just rebooted it recently, like in the last couple of years, as their like auteur horror division. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they've done films like The Prodigy. Um, they're doing this new Gretel and Hansel movie that's going to be coming out soon. They did um, Child's Play. I like the that new, Gretel the new... and Hansel. It's very yeah, very current. Like... <laughs> Switching it up. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, they uh, they got behind Jim's um, werewolf script that he had written like a couple years ago. Um, a, a bunch of companies essentially came to us after Thunder Road, after mm-hmm. we won the grand jury at South by, and they um, they're like, "What other scripts do you have?" And you know, Jim had like three or four other scripts that he had kind of in his back pocket, and. Um, XYZ, they did like The Invitation and like a bunch of other great, great um, horror and thriller movies. They came to us and they're like, does Jim have any genre movies? And uh, Jim's like, I had this werewolf script that I wrote a couple of years ago. And they're like, great, send it to us. They read it. They loved it. Um, they brought it to MGM. MGM loved it. And it essentially was a very quick green light. And then we started um, shooting that in uh, March of this of this past year in Utah. Um, we were there for oh, a couple awesome. months. And uh yeah, we've been in post um, ever since we got back and just picture locked and it's going to be released. Um, we just got a release date, March 21st of 2020. It's going to be a wide theatrical release. Awesome. Holy cow. So exciting. That's so crazy. I mean, if someone came to you and, you know, like, because you're going to Austin Film Festival next week and they're like, hey, what do you got? Um, you got any features? You'd be like, oh, yeah, I have a, yeah, I have a yeah, genre feature. And then yeah. you'd like run home and try to like write a genre feature. But then somehow Jim Cummings has a script that everyone loves. He's got like... it in the shoebox. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. let, let's talk a little bit more, actually, Natalie, about um, the way that you work with filmmakers, right? Like we talked a lot about Jim, and I'm sure we will plenty more in this episode. Um, but you also collaborated very closely with uh, Jocelyn and Dawn of Greener Grass. Um, and you're also a writer and director yourself. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So so tell us how how you come to work with these filmmakers and what your relationship is like. Tell, walk us through that whole thing. Yeah. I mean, usually... Um, you know, people always ask like, oh, you know, like, do I just send you a script? Like, you know, how does it work? And like, I, you know, I don't normally go off of scripts. It's like all about like people and mm-hmm. like just relationships. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, with with Jim, um, um, I met him uh, because so right after he won the grand jury at Sundance for his th- a short film of Thunder Road, he got commissioned by full screen um, to do this like series of this anthology series mm-hmm. of six short f- um, films that were all single takes and um, c- getting commissioned to do short films. Who's ever heard of that? Sure, right. Unfortunately, full screen is no longer in existence, yeah. but you know. um, <laughs> if we had, yeah, <laughs> every time someone said that about some company on this podcast, we'd and we always have a show on that network. I had a full screen show. Oh, yeah. I did Go multiple. ninety. Go ninety. Yeah, I had two Black full screen Pills. series, and it was just like, oh, wait. Yeah, what about I'm... Maker? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I almost had a Maker series too, and then then they went out. Um, oh. Pretty rough, you guys. <laughs> yeah the Sorry. the second full screen series that I did is called Living Rooms. Um, it it. Uh, we got a call from our execs over there three days before we were supposed to go live. We had all the key art, all the marketing, mm. the trailer was done, the film was ready, delivered, or the series was ready and delivered. And um, three days before we were supposed to go live, we get a call from our execs and they just sounded shell-shocked. They're like, 
hey, we just came out of a conference meeting and um, it sounds like full screen's going under. So we don't know what's happening with their series. We don't know what's happening with our jobs, but we just thought sure. we should let you know. And you're like, how did you not see this coming? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was like such a bummer because then like we had this show that like ended up not like Ever getting seen. a release. Sure. Um, yeah. We ended up being able to like, you know, get it to a, a different place. But it's it's kind of it totally fizzled because it didn't yeah. have that that push. Um, but yeah, so Jim was like looking for a producer to help him with this full screen series. Um, and so he went to Matt Miller, a vanishing angle um, and said, like, I need a producer for this. And, and Matt was like, oh, you should talk to Natalie. Um, and I'd been doing a couple of little Vanishing Angle projects as well as freelancing a bunch of other places. And so Jim and I met and we just like Im- immediately clicked. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I was in the middle of producing a YouTube Red series at the time. And essentially uh, the day that we wrapped was on a Friday. And then um, on the next Monday, I started pre-pro for his full screen series um, and was like wrapping out the other project I was, I was, I was starting his um, series. And then so we did those six short films. Yeah. And then when he got asked a topic, commissioned three more short films from him, which he asked me to produce. And then but uh, yeah. And then we did the Thunder Road feature together, obviously. And so um, in in the middle of all of that, um, Don and Jocelyn had actually they had had the Greener Grass short Mm -hmm. at the festival circuit at the same time as the Thunder Road short. Can I ask you, sorry, just to back up a second, because I think a question I hear from our listeners a lot is like, hey, I'm I'm a filmmaker and I know you guys keep saying to just shoot it. But like I need I have a script and I have like an idea. But I, I need someone to like help produce this for me. Like when you first started working with Jim, he came to you with a project and a distributor and a budget already, right? Like mm-hmm. you didn't have to worry about those yeah. things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot but of- But Greener Grass was just an idea. Right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Green and Grass was a script. I mean, I had done a short film with with, with the two of them before that, but um, but yeah, I mean, like I had done a ton of short films before um before working at VA and and, and had done a bunch of like pilots and things, and a lot of those was just like let's let's figure it out, you know, like sometimes the um if it's a short film that the director wants to use as like a proof of concept or just like as like a, a calling card um sometimes like they'll um you know self-finance it but like i would come in to you know help them with the logistics and getting everyone on board um sometimes and what's your grants. why would you do that um like the real question is are you getting paid for all of those or are some of them like passion projects so when i first started producing um i was I was just making my own short films and like I, I literally just bought a DSLR camera, started like shooting stuff, editing it on my laptop. And um, and it was in the process of doing that. I started submitting to festivals and they started getting like awards and attention. I was like, oh, this is cool. I'll make more of these. And you went to CalArts, right? You went I to went to CalArts, but no, not oh. to film school. I have a master's in dance. Oh. oh. Yeah. That's so cool. I was. That, frankly, that makes a little more sense because <laughs> CalArts is like real artsy fartsy like, yes it's that's very where experimental I learned the, the term art school damage you know you come out <laughs> into the real world and you're like oh wait like yeah there's a whole n- no one cares about my commerce. experimental animation degree exactly yeah so yeah so i was studying choreography there i was making these like really weird experimental theater um things and um and yeah so i started making these films on the side and then my film school friends actually were like hey can you help me make my short the way that you made your short and, you know, for a lot of the theater things, I was booking the vendors. I was, like, booking the venues. Mm-hmm. I was casting. I was, I, was, I was doing all the things. You were producing. I was producing. And so um, and so I would just, like, help them out. And, like, I didn't even really, I don't think, understand what the word producer was. It was just what I had done for all of my projects. And so I was like, yeah, I can help you do those things. Um, and so – and then my friends started recommending me to, like, their other friends. Mm-hmm. So it became, like, a friend of a friend thing. And I was just, like, helping out on those projects for free. And then one day someone reached out to me and was like – hey, so-and-so recommended you. We want you to produce this short film. Um, here's what we can pay you. And I'm like, oh, cool. I can get paid for this. <laughs> like, <"Excellent." laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's like totally a word of mouth thing that I just like was like doing it and then just started getting paid to do it, um, which is awesome. And were you always, like even on that first paid gig, do you read the script and like give note? Like you, were you always on the creative side of things as well? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, cause I think a lot of people knew that I was like directing a lot of my own stuff and, and that I had come from like a creative background of like directing and writing and choreographing for the theater. And so, um, yeah, it was like always just a very collaborative relationship. Like I, I often say that the producer director is like, um, like it's like, it's a marriage. Like you're like in it together. Um, in, in, in an ideal world, you have a producer that's like in it, in the trenches with you, like helping, you know, with like the, like the creative and also with the business and the logistics side. But, um, but it should be like a, like a team that, you know, you don't kind of separate. 
And so, do you ever, have you done projects where you feel like you're, what you th- see creatively is different than what the director's seeing creatively? Um, early on, uh, just because I was kind of taking on whatever projects people asked me to do. So I wasn't really being very, very picky. I feel like for some of those, um, I, I, I was kind of like, oh, I don't understand what the director's vision is here or, um, or I'm, I, I, I'm not super, you know, wild about this material, but I'll just like do it. Um, I did a lot of, uh, like, um, features that were just just like literally existed just to make money um so mm-hmm. uh, like a, like creature feature type things uh like like genre like, stuff? like international pre-sales movies like you know right. oh this is a family movie it'll do great you know kind of thing so um so i did a lot of those um that i just learned a lot um and and uh and that was great but but then as i started doing more and more i started being able to be a little bit more picky of like cool like this is the kind of project i want to be doing but yeah jim was actually the person that introduced me to don and jocelyn um because they had known each other on mm-hmm. the festival circuit they had um written and uh starred in two short films the the greener grass short and this film called buzz but they hadn't directed them and so when they were getting ready to do their directorial debut as a short film called the arrival they went to jim and they're like we need a producer who would you recommend we need some help yeah and um and he was like you should talk to natalie and so i met with them and like we uh, i just love them so much (laughs) i'm totally obsessed with them so uh so yeah so um i produced their short film for them the arrival and then what about tony ascenda how does that tie into any of this stuff. oh yeah so tony and that's why i asked the college humor question because everyone you've worked with worked at college humor yeah and they all like went to emerson so everyone thinks that i oh, went yeah. to emerson but i went sure. to emory which is very funny but um very confusing right? <laughs> but yeah so tony was actually the first um one of the first directors that i worked with at vanishing angle so um i had done oh. this pilot at va um for this show um, called Matt Pat's Game Lab that we had, that eventually mm-hmm. became a YouTube Red series, um, and the second project that I did at VA, <laughs> Matt Miller reached out to me. Um, it was a music video with Tony Senda for um, the band Three Hundred Three. Do you guys know them? Um, in anyway, uh, it's it's a song called My Dick. Mm-hmm. And so after yeah, like Tony, I, I like the ring little, of that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony's yeah. made a whole career out of yeah. dick jokes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very yeah. impressive. Yeah, well done, done. <laughs> um, and he's awesome, but like tasteful dick jokes. <laughs> oh yeah, oh s- like smart, smart yeah. dick jokes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so uh, so Matt reached out to me and he was like, "Hey, you did a great job on the pilot. Um, I have this music video. I just like want to check in with you. Are you okay with like?" Um, off color humor, <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, totally." Like, like, what's up? And he's like, "I have this music video for a buddy. Um, it's called My Dick. <laughs> Can you work on it?" And I was like, "Sure." So, um, so, so that's, that's when I met Tony. Um, so, so I actually worked with Tony before I worked with Jim. Um, oh, and was that was American Vandal already? That made? No, that was before American Vandal. Oh, um, but so he yeah. did all the little dicky stuff. Um, yeah, so I did the Lil Dicky f- Freaky Friday video, which was super or, fun. But he had done the other Lil Dicky stuff before. Is, yeah. Because my dick, it, you're saying is 303 is the name of the band? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yeah, I know. Little Dicky, my dick, dicks. it's very... Yeah. It's very confusing. Um, but uh, but yeah, and, and Tony and Jim are friends. And I think I think that's how Matt knows them. I don't know. It's like, it's just kind of this whole group of people that... That's Matt? Or become, Vanishing Angle Matt? No, Matt. Yeah, 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 yeah Matt yeah, Miller. Yeah. 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 So... Um, yeah, it's just this kind of a small world uh, that I worked with a lot of the same people. I Crazy. think what's awesome about your story and why it's different than a lot of stories we hear is because you started kind of doing something you loved and then you're making your own things and you had reasons and you were very excited. And then you got like the, you know, into the, the movies that like you said are just made to make money, but they're not really anyone's passion project. Um, and somehow you like veered back into like artful movies that are good. And then now you're like making artful movies that are good that have budgets, which is like kind of the (laughs) holy grail. Well, I think the secret though, is that I think there are plenty of people who have movies under their belts and like, they're like, Hey Jim, I love you, but like, I can't make a movie for no money. Right. Um, Not to say that there was no money, but like it wasn't millions of dollars. Right. So it's going to be really hard. Right. And so, I and think, did you produce Thunder Road, the short? No, that was before I met Jim. Oh, okay. Um, but his next nine short films after that. Oh, right. right. Um, and a film called The Robbery that went to Sundance. Um, and uh, yeah, a bunch of others. Yeah. But, but so, you know, you'd be like, dude, I did nine shorts with a, for you for a, a digital platform that doesn't exist anymore. I'm going to go like 
do something more lucrative, right? That would be an easy decision to make. Um, but that's how you like, if you build a team, right. And the community where you're making things together regularly all the time, that's how it kind of slowly builds into something where you have real budgets all of a sudden, you know? Yeah. I mean, I say, I say a lot, find your tribe. Like to me, I get to make cool projects with my friends and that is like the dream job. And I don't care if it's micro budget, like, you know, this MGM project that we just did like has like a decent budget, but now the beta test that we're doing is another like micro budget, ultra low budget um, film. And so we're kind of like hopping back and forth and to us, it doesn't matter. You know, we're just, we're just trying to make cool work and we're doing it with all the people that we love and respect. And so um, I would much rather work on a low budget movie and get paid very little, but work with people that I really care about um, and, and respect and, and who I trust then, um, you know, I've been on like the bigger budget sets where it can be like a more sure. toxic environment. And right. Let me ask in terms of the decision making process, in terms of like what you guys are making next, right? Is it as simple as like, oh, like, you know, we pitched this, you know, studio and they said yes. Like how, how are you deciding what those next steps are, right? Like you're just on this, this treadmill now of making all of these great movies. Do you weigh in and say, hey guys, I want to do this thing or... Is it just kind of more of like catch what catch and catch can? Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's like a little bit of both. Um, so there's definitely so I'm doing a, a project um, beginning of next year. That's like a, a much bigger budget movie, like three times, you know, like what this um, this MGM movie was. Uh, that's going to be really exciting. And that's it was just something where we got recommended as a production company um, mm -hmm. and like the producing team. And it's like great, this movie got, you know, is getting financed, like, let, like, let's do it. And we happened to be able to pitch a director that we really loved, Josh Rubin. I don't know if you guys sure, know yeah, him. Sure, yeah, of course. Yeah, he's yeah. been on the podcast. Yeah. Um, oh, awesome. Great. Yeah. So I love Josh. So, so we actually pitched him. They didn't have a director attached. And we were like, we think we have a really great director for this. Um, and so we sent him to them and they loved him. And so he's now directing it. And so it, like, it was one of those things that it was like, okay, cool. This is like a script that's like, it's fun, mm -hmm. you know, but like might not be the thing that we like necessarily pick to do as like our next big thing, but then getting to pitch Josh and hearing his take on it and a filmmaker that we care about, then all of a sudden it becomes like, oh, we can make this something really, really awesome together. Awesome. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's he's, all he's also a college humor guy. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a song. Wait, so how did you did you work with him on stuff before? So I forget how I initially met Josh. I think the girls actually recommended me to him. He mm -hmm. asked me to produce a short film of his a while ago and I wasn't able to for, because of scheduling. Um, and then he knew Matt Miller somehow. And he, like, he'd just been kind of circling in our friend group and he and Jim had become friends. Um, and then when he, so he just finished his first feature um, and that's like getting submitted to festivals right now. And so he had invited me to this like feedback screening at like one of his like first feedback screenings and I had went and saw it and I was like Josh this is like really good I went in with no expectations I had I had no idea what it was about I had no idea like if it was going to be good I had, I had no idea and I watched it and I was like this is great um and I gave him some thoughts you know and um and it was actually based off of seeing that we had this like meeting for this new movie um, like a couple weeks later mm -hmm. and like having seen that, I'm like, oh, that's the exact same tone as this movie needs. And so it was an easy pitch to make. Um, wow. But that's pretty lucky if you're Josh. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's jumping yeah. from like a micro budget to a like sure. full union. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, but I, I think also you have to take a look at like he made the micro budget movie that that's the reason you thought of him. Right. Mm -hmm. He did the thing. He did it scrappy. Just mm -hmm. shot it. Right. And also has like a formidable commercial career so he had the experience of knowing how to deal with large crews in a, in a and also real meaningful pitch, way pitch to client which mm -hmm. was like the big sure. thing he was able to do a really really great pitch um but yeah i mean his his first feature was like total micro budget he shot it at like his family's cabin mm -hmm. like it was just like him and a friend who were in it like it's like super you know tiny but he knew that that's what he could do and he took a lot of like um you know you know plays out of the thunder road book so to speak of like you know just like Figuring out how to just get it, get it done. He's yeah. also in a movie called What Children Do that I remember. I talked to him about I it. I haven't seen that. Uh, I need wait, to. Wasn't the director on our podcast? Yeah, Dean Peterson. Dean Peterson was on the show. Or is um, Dean Peterson the guy that murdered his wife in San Francisco? <laughs> <laughs> you know, funny enough, same guy. Yeah. Um, 
talented yeah. filmmaker, <laughs> yeah, yeah. horrible husband. Yeah. And, and Josh is also, he, he was in Greener Grass, but his scene got cut, no. which is such a bummer. Oh, that's such a bummer. Um, he plays this like pool, like the swimming coach at this, <laughs> at this community pool. And that's he is really hilarious. Funny. But his scene is in the like extras oh, on like sure. iTunes and on, and on the DVD. So awesome. if you want to see Josh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty hard to not see Josh. I feel like he's in every other he thing I He's in so I, much. I watch. Yeah. yeah. He's incredible. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited to get to finally produce for him um, beginning of next year. Right. That's awesome. I mean, he is lucky in that he made this movie that hasn't even played a festival yet. And it's his first movie. And he has this yeah. giant multi-million yeah, well, dollar movie. Uh, again, though, I think it's important. I could, I'm not so, saying he's not talented, but no, sure, sure, sure. I'm saying, you know. But more importantly, I think taking a step back, I feel like, especially when I was younger, I, I would listen to a podcast like this and I would right. be like, Back in how the 80s. is it that all of these pe- people are friends with each other and they all know each other and they're all hiring each other. This is the coolest thing I've ever heard of. Right? And also it seems like, impenetrable. Impenetrable. How do, you, how do you become a part of that scene? How does that happen? And I think it's just important to point out that like, A, it, you know, this is 10, 15 years in the making, right? Like Josh was in New York working on like dumb college humor sketches before it was a real company, right? And that's kind of a thing that helped coalesce work and opportunity for people and that we could all kind of like be in the same room together, right? But we all had to kind of move to New York, move to LA, figure it out, you know, practice, right? Level up, do these commercials, do a bunch of micro budget shorts, do a bunch of micro budget features. And then now it's like, oh, we all get to see each other at a fun release party, you know? Well, and he was really good about like checking in and following up, which is like so important. And I think people don't give it enough credit. And I think they're scared to do it or how to do it. And some people do it really wrong. Let's um, talk about that yeah, actually. Yeah. Because, is... because I'm sure that I'm one of those people. You yeah. know, like you're just like, <laughs> who you is, can, oh. you can, I, you're sw- literally, you can see me sweating as I'm typing the like, yeah, I'm like, just uh, I know you're really email. busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's an art and, and, and I get those reach outs a lot and like, and, and the difference between the ones that are good and bad mm-hmm. are like it's it's such a drastic chasm. Um, but okay, yeah. let's start with the bad ones. What's a bad reach out? <laughs> well, well, let's start with Josh because because Josh, you know, he checked in about a short film. He, like he he like I was recommended to him to produce a short film years ago. I wasn't able to do it, and instead of like you know being upset that I wasn't able to do it or like you know he just continued to check in like every once in a while. He was in greener grass. So he's... Well, hold on, what what would he say though? I'm, I'm, we're going to get nitty gritty. Sure, maybe, um, maybe let's let's make it a tiny bit more abstract. Josh is like a good example, but in general, in a general, good, a good check in. So would be... yeah, so a good check in is like you know, hey, are you able to you know work on my project? No, okay, great, like no worries. Um, and then every few months, you know, mm-hmm. maybe like every three to six months, just checking in to be like, hey, hope you're well. Um, uh, if you have something new to share, it's like, hey, I had this new short film, just, you know, just wanted to send it to you and no pressure to act like, like it's, there's no, you know, there's can't no, wait like, to hear your feedback. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, sure. it's just like, here, here's this thing. And even if I don't watch it, I'm still like, oh, that person, right. Top Made of mind. Thing. Yep. Yeah. And then, um, and then also checking in to say congratulations. So like, mm-hmm. so checking in every, every few months, if you have something new to share and then also checking in every few months to be like, Hey, I saw, I saw I, you have greener grass in theaters. Congrats. congrats. Yeah. And there's no. Wow. That's a, that's a pretty big one. That's a good, that's such because a good Because I'm one. always like, oh, they're. Yeah, hey, actually, Maggie Kylie, who's on the podcast. Sure, sure. She's Kara, my wife, auditioned for something she's directing uh, yesterday. And I was like, should I just send her a note and just say what's up? And then I, I know that she just had this big Warner Brothers deal, like a whatever you call those deals. Um, and um, and I emailed her. I was like, hey, congrats on the Warner deal. And just, to, just letting you know, just putting out there, my wife auditioned for your, your episode yesterday. And she wrote back and she's like, oh, thanks so much. You know, and I was like. I, I don't know. I just felt weird. Like everyone's probably congratulating her on this deal. Like I don't want right. to be that but person that's, that's nice. like piling on. It's but like the happy birthday people on Facebook that you don't know. Yeah. Well, well there's a difference between not knowing them and like a, on Facebook and an email. A personal email that's just like checking in. Yeah. You'd be surprised like how few of those I get. I get a lot of like, you know, f- like Facebook congrats or whatever. But just getting like a personal congrats. It's just like, hey, I saw this thing, you know, 
awesome. Mm -hmm. And then it's just like a regular person that I'm used to getting emails from. And, and if something pops up in those three months, that person's now top of my mind. I'm like, Oh, I want to find something for them. And, and also to, um, and so shouldn't you put your headshot and your signature (laughs) so you remember them? Well, and, and, and I do get reach outs where, um, you know, people are like, I, I, I want to get coffee with you. And I'm like, awesome. And I try to schedule as many general meetings as possible. Like, it's like really important to me to like meet new filmmakers. But sometimes like right now, for example, for the next like two weeks, it is sure. so hard to schedule just because I'm working like 12 to 16 hour days. I, like, I just like for my health, I just can't be adding sure. more to that. Yeah. I um, mean, it took us six months probably to book this conversation. Yeah. Right. Totally. Like that's just how long it takes to get something on the books. Yeah. yeah. Right. And you were so, a dancer when we tried to book you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. And so, and so sometimes I'll have like, um, I'll have people respond and get like really angry that, that I have to schedule something so far out yeah. or that, or that I won't sign on to their project or something. And, and I mean, Josh like reached out to me years ago and, and, and I've had other filmmakers with the same thing where the, the this DP that just shot a short film that I directed, um, he, he had reached out to me, I think it was six or seven years ago. He had seen one of my dance films online. He really loved it. He's like, Hey, can we get coffee? We got coffee six years ago. And he just continued to check in, send me like, Hey, I just finished this feature. Here's a link. I just finished this feature. Here's a still, um, like maybe like once a year. And then when this short film came up, I was like, Hey, I want to test out working with that guy. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. like, like let's do it. And so that was six years in the making. And I think some people, um, they don't realize how long of a game it is, but like you, it's like you sure. have to be committed and patient, but if you are, the payoff could be really, like really, really huge. Um, and don't be afraid to reach out. Like don't, right. don't, um, Just like guess I always, their email I always <laughs> welcome reach outs. Um, and like, and sometimes like I'm not able to meet or whatever, but like, I always welcome, you know, people just, you know, just checking in and saying, hi. I mean, we had PAs on Thunder Road that were literally just just like tweeted at Jim and we're like, hey, I want to help on your new movie. And he was like, come on down. And some of those PAs now work at VA mm-hmm. or like, you know, they're like now part of the family. It's like, it's it's just becoming part of the family, finding your tribe. And and once you find your tribe, then like that, it just slowly kind of, you know, expands. Sure. That's and, how you get to make three movies in a row. Yeah, yeah. And, and when you, you lo- sorry, uh, uh, just going back yeah, real quick before perfect. we move on. The thing I love about the congrats email is that then... It takes the pressure off the sender to have something new, right? Because mm-hmm. we all know that it takes a while to like get certain things going. You know, maybe like you know that short film took six months. You know, that it doesn't mean that you have to wait to reach out. Like if timing's right, then then you're good to go. Basically, mm-hmm. yeah. We've talked to each other about this. Like, hey, is it weird if I check in again after two weeks? And we're like, well, maybe if you had something new to add or something changed right, on the right, project. Exactly. Um, but, but the congrats move. But the that's congrats, a real move. There you go. And That's a real it, LinkedIn hacker there. <laughs> <laughs> but also, like, it doesn't literally have to be that. I think that there are probably other things that we're not thinking of, mm-hmm. blind spots, where it's not just let me tell you about myself. It's like, hey, I want to acknowledge a thing that I admire about you. Yeah, you know? and I think it just, it's um, uh, one of the best things I heard, and I heard this back in the dance world, where they they used to say, you're not auditioning for this audition and this project, you're auditioning for the next one. And so that takes the pressure off of that audition of like, I have to get this and there's this desperation and you can kind of like feel it. It kind of Mm -hmm. oozes off of you. And instead, if it's just like, hey, I'm just here to like make a friend, start a relationship and we'll see where it goes and maybe you'll cast me in your next thing. Like then, then all of a sudden it becomes like, oh, cool. You're just like a person and a human and like, let's just like chat and like talk. And then I end up like, you know, crewing up with that person or casting them or you know whatever it is do you guys think that it works with actors too oh I feel absolutely like a I've, lot of times I've cast people based off of that yeah where or, they've just like reached out and been like hey congrats on something and i'm like oh i totally forgot about you i want you to self-tape tonight you mm-hmm. know for this project that we're crewing up like that, that we're casting up like that's happened all the time yeah or even that because i feel like i've worked with like actors i really liked a lot like 10 years ago but then we just kind of like lost touch mm-hmm. and now i feel like it would be weird for me to email them but if i I think an actor would that alive. love it if you emailed them with like, hey, will you audition for this thing? I think that's the one time where it's always okay. Right. I think it is tricky because we're talking about a, a an ease of communication that not everybody always has, right? And so actors, I feel like, because you, you were saying before, like, oh, the, there's a vibe that you can sense in people when they need something. Or, mm-hmm. you know, we, I refer to it as being sweaty. <laughs> actors oftentimes have that as well, right? Mm-hmm. Like where... 
I understand you want that role so badly. And so you come on too strong and you send me a headshot and you send me an email and it's, it can be a turnoff, right? And so I guess really all I'm trying to say is people listening at home, right? Take a deep breath. Remember, there's a lot of different ways to figure it out. And like, maybe the congrats email is your move and maybe it's something a little more hands off or a little more subtle, but I, you know, I think knowing and taking solace in it being a long game again takes the pressure off a little bit. Yeah, it should it should be a comfort that it's a long game. Yeah. That it's just like, hey, like like there's no pressure. It's just like you're just like put like planting the seeds, and mm-hmm. like that's that's the only thing that you're doing. You're you're planting the seeds. Um, yeah, and and you know like something else. It's like a little bit harder to do, especially if you're you know super busy or whatever. But like also if there's someone that you just really admire and like really want to work with, just like check in with them and say. Hey, like I really admire your work. Is there any way like that I can help you on your next project? Is there is there anything that you need that I could help with? Like don't need to be paid, just whatever, just like checking in. And I can't tell you how many times it's been like people have reached out to me and I'm like, sure, like I'll I'll use some extra help. They'll come in like do a couple days for free and then like they're now like cr- crewed up for, you know, and hired right. for the next like sure. 3 years. Um so it you know, it sucks to like be like, "Oh, well I have to put in time for free." But mm-hmm. it's like if you just get in the group, then, you know, you'll eventually get, you'll, you'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. I think also it's tricky. You want to, I think people can be transparent with the amount of time that they have to give. Right. Like I think sometimes people here are like, Oh, I have to work for free. Well, I've got to work to eat, you know, um, which is a hundred percent valid. And, you know, everyone has different circumstances, but with whatever free time that you do have, and especially early on when you're young, you maybe have fewer responsibilities or fewer, you know, um, yeah, fewer responsibilities, just giving what time you have as authentically and openly as you can, I think is the other part of that conversation. You know, like if you're like, hey, I've only got six hours a week, like make them count and be clear with people, you know, and then... And that's actually more helpful sometimes mm-hmm. to like 100%. to to have someone come in and be like, "Hey, I have you know two hours every Monday that I would love to like learn how to produce. Like, is there anything that you might need help with? Can I just come by the offices? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, totally, yeah. great, and, then, and be reliable. I feel like way. you're going to get yeah. so many emails once this episode comes out, just congratulating <laughs> you on whatever. <laughs> It's going to be like right in the middle of shooting yeah, beta. Like so I might not get back to people congrats, until congrats, December. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like Natalie.Metzger. Yeah, yeah. So N.Metzger. Hotmail. Nat.Metzger. No dot. Um, well, so you said earlier that it's that people always ask you uh, like what you look for in a project and you really tell them it's like what you look for in a person. But I, I'm going to be annoying and ask you, is there something if Jim comes to you or Don uh, and Jocelyn or... Josh Rubin or who, any of these people, Tony has sent to come to you with a project and you have to decide what you're going to spend your next six months on or a year or whatever. What's like, what gets you excited about a project aside um, from the filmmaker? I really love sci-fi and I haven't gotten to produce a sci-fi yet, except for the short that I just directed. Um, but yeah, it's a genre that I just like love personally. And I feel like, um, yeah, I want to see more of and like, and, and a, a showing, science as being you know cool and like knowledge as being cool i think is also important mm-hmm. in the current climate yeah also stuff's can... way too nerdy <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say you can get uh is it a macarthur grant i think there's grant money out there for showing science in an uh, interesting light yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. sloan, sloan. Yeah. sloan yeah. that's what i'm thinking of yep. thank you mm-hmm. yeah so there you go yeah um, yeah if you want to hit hit to my heart it's, it's <laughs> yeah. science <laughs> okay yeah guys don't hit send on that email yet <laughs> Yeah. Put, uh, yeah, some Einsteins. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mention your Mensa remember. <laughs> is, um, well, so how about your directing? Like how, what's, I mean, you're, how are you finding time to direct and produce and congratulate um, all at the same time? Yeah, it's weird. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm somehow juggling it. Um, I just, I just did this sci-fi short called Immortal, which we just finished, um, like a couple weeks ago. Congrats. Um, thanks. That's awesome. Um, can you tell us the so, logline or? Uh, yeah, it's this, um, this genetic biologist that, uh, she is trying, uh, to search for a cure for death. Um, and she started doing her own research cause no one else takes it seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And when it gets discovered, uh, is that the premise of Reanimator? I think that might be the premise of Reanimator. I need to see Reanimator because I haven't sure. seen it. <laughs> I, I think you're you're okay unless you it's, chop a head off and then use that to go down on a person. Then you're really in trouble. <laughs> then then um, I'd really like yeah. rethink things. No. But this is like very yeah. like grounded sci-fi. Like yeah. like we actually, I'm just obsessed with the actual science of this, mm-hmm. the actual like anti-aging research. Um, it's very very fascinating to me. Um, and so we've been like working with like experts that are actually researching this kind of stuff because it's real. Like this stuff is really real. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah. So we've been digging into that. Um, it actually started. Are you guys looking as, at like the CRISPR stuff? Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, kind of. It's it's like all related. Like I won't get into the nerdy science details because it's like it's I can go down a rabbit hole, but it's these. Uh, the ends of your DNA strands have these things called telomeres, which are like little like shoelace caps. Right. That's, you can tell um, how old someone is with um, those, right? Yeah, exactly. And so if you can figure out how to keep those telomeres long, then you can like potentially extend hmm. life. Um, they've been able to do it in rats. But anyway, it's this whole thing that I'm fascinated by. Um, and so we wrote, um, my, my writing partner and I, um, Bob Belair, uh, we wrote this feature script that won the Gold Prize at the Page Awards a couple years ago. That's awesome. And um, and we we were really excited about it. And then I ended up, like that was when I started producing a ton of back-to-back features. And so we like, we just haven't had a chance to do anything with it. Um, and this year we were like, you know what? Like we want to do something with it. We're just going to do a short. And so we wrote a short film version, very separate from, from the feature, but just like same characters and concept. And um, yeah, we shot it in between all these other projects. Um, and, and you just paid it. for it yourself. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just like as a, a like a, a testing ground. for I Just us pull like a little bit of money from each feature you're producing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you seen uh, Superman two? I think it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. my uh, he's he's a composer, so he actually has um, he gets this stuff called mailbox money. You know, just like royalties oh, from right. from oh, shows sure. that he's done. Yeah. You know, and he's like you know worked on big projects like American Horror Story and other things. And mm-hmm. so, um, so that that's definitely helped with that. Yeah, a little bit budget. of that, that <laughs> Netflix money. <laughs> but also, you probably have like the best crew that. Um, yeah, I mean, luckily we had an amazing team of people that, that, that came together that all worked for very, very cheap to help make it happen. Um, and and we wrote it with budget in mind. Um, but yeah, so now we're like starting to get that feature up and running. Um, and then I'm also directing this um, like branded short doc uh, that I'm shooting in between beta and the end of the year. So um, Wow. Yeah. And so do you get stressed out at all? Um, I definitely get stressed for I, sure. I think um, you get like a spa day or two in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I feel I I wish I had time for a spa day, but um, no. But I mean, like it's it's also amazing. I'm like I'm I'm making movies with my friends. Like you know, we call it work, and like I'm at the office for very long hours. Mm-hmm. But it's also like I'm doing what I love. So it just it doesn't it doesn't feel like I need a break from it. It's mm-hmm. just you know, I mean, obviously getting some some sleep would be nice. But um, sure. but outside of that, it's just. I don't know. It's it's fun. It's amazing. It's cool. It's yeah. the best job ever. Yeah. I mean, there's the there's probably some hard parts, right? I mean, there's oh, like for sure. the contracts and negotiating and things yeah. falling well, apart. And on, and on projects like Greener Grass, um, well, and Thunder Road, where I was doing all of that myself, there was no legal, there was no accountant, there was mm-hmm. no EPM. It's like, I'm doing everything. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but it's still fun. And do you feel like you learned on the job with those situations or was it something where like you felt like, oh, you know, I've done this a handful of times and I've, you know, kept an eye on the accountant and things like that? Um, yeah, I've just kind of always done that. I've I'm I'm like a little OCD. So I'm the kind of person that really loves like spreadsheets and mm-hmm. color coding and like and and budgets and, and those things. So I um I just kind of naturally was like doing budgets and stuff for, mm-hmm. for my previous projects and like cost reporting and accounting just kind of, I like, yeah, I started to learn yeah. and just do. I, there, there is a jump though, right? There's the sure. like, okay, like I get how much, you know, I'm going to spend on this camera rental to like gap formatting on your, <laughs> you know, I don't even know how to finish that sentence, but you know what I mean? Like there's yeah. like, a, there's like an extra level of, you know, being like part lawyer, part accountant. Mm-hmm you know, yeah, the, that takes an, a special brain, I guess is what I mean to say. Yeah, I guess. Um, to be able to like format an accounting situation and also give creative notes. Yeah. Is, you're a bit of a unicorn in that way. That's why they're, <laughs> they're, they're multiple jobs. You know? um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think uh, a lot of it, you know, um, I, I read a lot of books. 
uh, which I think helps. Like I like totally when I first started producing, like a lot of those like shorts I was just producing for free. I just read as many producing books as I could. Like I went to the library. I went to Barnes and Noble. I was just like um, processing a lot of um, like a lot of stuff. So that stuff definitely helped. Any off um, the top of your head that you remember the titles of? Um. Oh gosh, it's been a while. They also uh, all have terrible titles. Right? They do. It's, it's like, like the, the producer producing the movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like, but also, I, I had a great resource. So early on, I started working with women in film, um, mm-hmm. and they have a PSA program, and so they do four commercials um, a year for different nonprofits. That's great. Um, That's and, a good one. And they raise the budget for those commercials, so that the nonprofit doesn't have to pay for their own commercial. Um, but so they, it's great because they they get this team together. Um, and so you like pick out the nonprofit that that you think you like vote on on which nonprofit gets the commercial. You um, work on the creative and like send it to client and go back on like notes and back and forth. And then you make it and then it gets like broadcast on air at the end of the year. And so and this is all volunteer based, though. It's all right? yeah. You know, yeah, all yeah. volunteer. But it's like it you know the meetings happen I think once a month, and so it's like twelve twelve meetings a year. Sure. Um, and so I started doing that really really early on. And that's where I got um, a lot of my commercial experience and like and, and and being on bigger sets where it's like, cool, there's 70 crew members and I'm learning how to do this. And I very quickly, I think the first one I like PA'd on and then the next one I was an associate producer on, the next one I produced and then like the next two I directed and then and I became an EP. Um, a year and a half, it sounds like, basically. Like yeah. Basically, if there's four a year, right? Um, so I was only doing like one or two a year. Oh, gotcha. um, okay. Yeah. So it was like, oh, like, like over the course of three years. Still, um, yeah. And then I ended up on their business affairs committee. So um, I was like the one picking who was producing and directing. And um, yeah, that was like a great resource just to, to, to learn how other people did it. Cause mm-hmm. like I had kind of created my own systems, my own workflows, like my own um, spreadsheet templates and my own things. And I'm like, oh, this is how someone else does it. But the thing that I learned on that, that I think is important for people to know is that I, like, I thought that I was a total hack like I, I was like well I just I just created these spreadsheets because like it's what made sense to me mm-hmm. um but like how did the real people do it and then I saw that the real people like it actually wasn't that different from what they were doing and yeah. they or just worse. made it themselves as well yeah, yeah. or yeah or, maybe they're worse yeah, at spreadsheets. Or, like, or yeah or sometimes I was like why are they doing it that way it makes a lot right. more sense to do it this way <laughs> yeah. and so um and so yeah it was just kind of like one of those things where I learned what I could on set I like read a lot and then I just like did a lot like I did a ton of short films like a ton of commercials music videos whatever I could get on set for whatever I could like learn. Um, And so eventually it got to the point where like, it doesn't feel complicated to Mm -hmm. me and like the legal stuff in terms of like negotiating with like agents and and talent. um, I feel like that's like a lot of just people skills and being able to, to, to talk to people. And, and I kind of have like a, a no diva policy. And so Mm -hmm. when agents come with like crazy stuff, like I just, um, I was told recently uh, by, by an agent um, who like saw me at Sundance, he's like, you're Natalie Metzger. And I, I was like, yes who are you and he was like oh i represent so and so we've been you know going back and forth and he's like you're a fierce negotiator <laughs> and i was like i mean it, like maybe but it's also i know what the budget has you know has i sure. made the budget i know what we have like it's all one person doing it all so i know like intrinsically exactly what can be spent on every right. single thing and like we didn't have any more to give you so like i'm not a fierce negotiator i just like know what the limit is and i'm not willing to be bullied yeah um, i think agents maybe have sometimes this old school thought of like oh she's holding out on me totally like they're just mm-hmm. spending that trailer money mm-hmm. on something else well and they do bully people because sure. like like i like you I know mean, I've, they're kind of professional bullies they are that's oh, kind absolutely. of the yeah. yeah 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 um and i mean and, so there's hope for your great. shithead kids out there everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and i mean and great for them to be able to get their clients you know the better thing like sure. i'm all about you know people being you know paid well and you know and all those things but you know like with, with a lot of our projects that are micro budget, it's just, it's just you know, th- you know, this is what we have is your client in and out. If they're if they're out, it's totally fine. Like we can go to someone else. Yeah. Um, there and are plenty of famous people. You know? <laughs> right. Or like or non famous people that are actually really amazing, but are right. getting overlooked because they don't have a name. Well, right. Can we just talk about that for a second? I mean, I know uh, you're what's another thing that's impressive about you and the movies you've made is they're very successful, kind of despite not having. Uh, you know, not all of them having like very famous people in them. Like, and I know a lot of our listeners, like they always think that's like how they're going to make their movie, get their movie made is they attach someone. Like, what's your take on that and how important it is? And is that something that you work on a lot? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a tough thing. You, uh, I feel like it depends on the budget level of like whether you need to think of name talent or not. I mean, it, 
it never hurts to have name talent um for things that are you know over i disagree sometimes it does <laughs> yeah okay sorry you're right you're right <laughs> um but you know if you're over two million um you know, having some kind of name talent, you know, and you can, you know, go back and forth of like what actually is name talent or not, or like the level, but over 2 million, if you're trying to raise that, you probably need to have someone attached that's at least recognizable. Maybe that isn't a name, you know, so to speak, but, um, but if you're doing a micro budget, there are other ways to get your movie financed, you know, of like just someone that has seen your work at a festival and like really, you know, is like supportive of it. That's how Thunder Road got made. Um, or like doing things like crowd equity. So the beta test we financed through this new platform called WeFunder, um, which is crowd equity. So it's different than Kickstarter. So instead of like giving $100 and you get like a poster back, instead you invest $100 and you are a profit participant that's getting 120% back off of yeah. your investment. Um, and that's, so It's funny you bring that up actually because my wife is doing a movie in January mm. uh, and we are launching a WeFunder November 4th, basically. Awesome. Yeah, oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and it's, it's Christmas? quite exciting. Huh? Christmas movie? The Christmas movie. Yeah, oh, yeah. cool. Um, and I, so far can't say n uh, nice enough things about them. Like yeah. the, the TLC that you get and like how much support and how much handholding they give you is really frank, like remarkable. Like we have a point person. I've had like multiple conversations with all of them. They can like point you in the right direction in terms of like what sort of help you need and like how to get it. Or maybe like what other people have done. There's all sorts of really interesting ways that they're helping out in a way that like, a Kickstarter, you're just kind of like pushed in off the deep end. Like yeah. there's literally not a, a person out there that yeah. can help you. Whereas so, like they reached out to us. Like we just kind of signed up to be like, oh, we're going to start a little dummy profile. And they were like, hey, like, is this real? Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, yeah. How does it work? Like from a legal standpoint, let's say you raise 200 grand to make your movie mm -hmm. and then you're done shooting and you're out of money. You're over budget. You still need to do post. You need another hundred grand. And and a, and a big investor comes in with a hundred grand. Does that dilute? So you can't bring in an additional investor for hundred grand. You have to make it work for the initial budget. It's oh, yeah, wow. yeah. It's like it's like so. So you've like agreed to like a certain split. So each you know investor gets like a certain amount. I guess you could potentially renegotiate with everyone, but like we have a ton of different investors for you know for beta test. I forget the exact number, but um, but we raised three hundred fifty k in twelve days. Wow. Um, and we were taking. A lot of Ks. We, we were taking bets internally at the office of um, of like how long it would take to raise mm -hmm. the money and if we would even raise it. And, and, and it was also one of those things of, um, of, you know, like we were kind of testing it out. Like, is this even sure. a thing that works for like kind of self-financing? And it's not self-financing, but like, like kind of taking the initiative on your own. And um and we did it and like, and um, Matt Miller won. Uh, I, I, I was the most conservative. I'm like, it's going to take at least five weeks if, if we get it. Um, and Matt was like two weeks and it ended up being 12 days. It was, it was so fast. Um, and, you know, and people it's, it, it's similar with Kickstarter where you have like different levels. So people can get like in exchange for giving $50,000, they get an executive producer credit and like a logo on the movie or, you know, like they get perks beyond just being a profit participant. But, um, but like, but, but it's also cool because it puts the audience in control of like, they're like, I, you know, am investing in this movie and mm -hmm. I want to see this get made, which is great. But then also like, if it does well, I can make money off of it. So they're also like encouraged, to like help the right. movie be successful. That's like Tesla. He was selling off shares of the company, you know, to make the first line mm -hmm. of cars. Um, did, uh, what was I going to ask? Oh, um, do you think you raised that much money so fast? Cause Jim has like a pretty strong social media. Yeah, following. definitely. I mean, I mean that, that definitely helped. Um, because like the crazy thing about it is that we didn't even share a script. So we raised that amount of money without even sure. sharing a script. What did you share? Um, uh, Jim did a little video and um, there was like a little blurb about what the film was about. Um, and that was kind of, how many kind of people, it. How many followers does he have? <laughs> I mean, he's, you know, he has definitely, a, you know, an audience base and fan base. But, um, but yeah, I think, I think, you know, if you, if you can also keep the budgets economical, mm -hmm. then like that, like that allows you to take a lot more creative risk and allows you to get your movie made faster, which is sure. like, I think, I think sometimes I, I hear filmmakers that are like, oh, well, I need at least $2 million for my first feature. I, I need at least a million dollars for my first feature. And I'm like, okay, well that might take you years to raise and you might raise it, which is, would be great, sure. but like you also might not ever raise it and and wouldn't it be better just to make a feature now that's sure. cheaper that you can figure out how to do cleverly creative problem solve to get the budget lower 
make that and then let the $2 million be your second feature, you yeah. know, like, like figure out ways to just, just to make it, just shoot it. You know, we had Sarah Dina Smith on, who's now got an overall deal at Amazon and a uh, show shot all of, uh, looking for Alaska and Hannah before that is like a, you know, a big deal, fancy director now. Um, and her first feature, like all of the money sort of fell through last minute. And then like she had to scramble shot her for, her what became her first feature for fifty thousand dollars and she point blank was like no one's going to give you two million dollars no yeah. one's going to do it they want they it's, so you're like it's it's you we never want to say you're that josh rubin and natalie was at your screening but <laughs> josh already shot a movie before that and had a huge commercial career yeah and he did his first feature for that he like did himself that he used the resources that he had there was sure. a total micro budget very very low budget um and so the fact that he had that and yeah, and like reached out about the screening and the fact that I happened to be available was awesome. And then like, and we saw it and we pitched him, but um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think people sometimes like hold out for this thing and like, it's just, that used to be the way that it sure. was. And it just like, isn't anymore just, just because there's so, there's so much content um, and it's, and it's really hard to get a first feature f- you know, financed. Um, so it, but if, but if you can prove it, if you can do it on your own and there's ways to, you know, not only you know, do crowd equity, but like also self-distribute. So like you can kind of like be in control the whole time. Um, and, uh, and if you do it right, then, uh, you'll get your next movie made. Yeah. Awesome. There you go. And Jim has 79,000 Twitter followers, uh, um, and he follows 49,000. Yeah, there you go. Um, but we, we could, we should do a whole episode on equity crowdfunding soon. Um, but I would say, having looked at both Jim's We Funder and then a handful of others, there's not that many films out there yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's important to look at the other ones that don't have the same sort of social media following that still are raising six figures. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? I don't I don't want to be like, hey, this is the silver bullet for everybody to fix everything. They're, they're, they've been very clear it's still a long road. Crowdfunding, no matter whether it's equity or Kickstarter, is, is a challenge mm-hmm. for sure. But I guess what I'm saying is like, if it's right for you, do your research basically because... I know not everyone has the a huge, you know, social media following or a podcast or whatever, yeah. but that doesn't mean that you can't make it happen. Um, and like, we should do a micro or a, a, a equity crowdfunding conversation real some other time. Real quick, Natalie, we've heard you use the word micro budget a bunch of times, and I come sometimes think of that as a dirty word. Mm. You know, like we always joke about if you pitch the show on like how you made this your movie for zero dollars. I'm like, well, then it's probably not that good because you would lead with it's a good movie. Mm-hmm. And then maybe eventually you mentioned it was zero dollars. Um, but you say micro like it's no big thing. Right. How do you feel about micro budgets? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, like to me, the word micro budget, I, I usually use for anything under 250K. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh yeah, I don't know. I think there is sometimes some a freedom in, in micro budgets. I think it's like why, you know, after doing this um this like studio movie for Jim's second feature, it's why we're, you know, doing a like a, a micro budget as as his third feature. It's just there is a freedom in um getting lean and mean with the crew. Mm-hmm. Um you can be so much more mobile, you can move so much quicker. Um and as long as everyone knows what they're doing, um sometimes like it it can actually sometimes be more fun. Now, granted, there's definitely been times when I've done a movie that's sure. that I'm just like, like I'm just blah, doing blah, blah, everything blah, blah. and I can't, you know, I, like I can't even, I don't have the bandwidth to even be creative here. But um, uh, but yeah, there can be a freedom with micro budgets that um and 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 a and a freedom from like being like being able to take creative risks because the financial burden isn't necessarily on mm-hmm. them. Um, they're more likely to make their money back. Um, and so if they're good. Um, but so that helps to just like let you kind of do your thing. And I think sometimes it allows directors just to be able to be more truly themselves um, than to have like other feedback and other people. Um, yeah. Well, that's perfect. That, we'll talk about like wrapping it up perfectly. Yes. Um, cool. Should we, do you know about unpaid endorsements? Unpaid endorsements. So I've been traveling a lot lately for work and my phone keeps dying on me. And I know like every person has like a charging stick or whatever and they like kind of work and they stop working you got them for free and you lose them um but the the dp i've been working with has this awesome one and he uh it's called the the mobile power bank 9000 milliamp it's this uh awesome thing it has like the has a lightning cable a micro usb cable and a usb c cable all built into it so you could 
charge your phone and your laptop like at the same time and it fits in your pocket and it's 28.99 and i told uh, my dp i was like hey what's the brand you have i want to buy one of those and then he's like hold on wait till cyber tuesday you'll get a way better deal and then i went and i saw him at a tech scout and he's like hey i got something for you and he just gave it to me Ah. and um and it's something that i've noticed he does a lot like he gives like you know holiday gifts to like directors he works with and things and it's Something that sometimes I I forget. I mean, I know producers are tend to be better at that type of relationship keeping, but like even like as a DP or a different crew position, like kind of giving something, it, it's kind of awesome. a nice little thank you gift. Yeah. I love that. So that's it. The mobile power bank 9,000. I think I might buy one on Cyber Tuesday, unless Yuki, you're listening. <laughs> yeah. Yuki, uh, Matt needs one. <laughs> Natalie, uh, what you got? Um, I am really into docuseries. In fact, like most of the things that I um, consume outside of producing is nonfiction. Um, but there's this docuseries that I'm just obsessed with on Netflix called Explained. And I like recommend it to everyone that I know. They like, it's just like a 15 minute episodes and they have like two or three seasons now. And it's like different episodes are about completely random things like athleisure to the female orgasm to the exclamation point. And like, it's just like a little like, um, you know, this is what this is. This is like why it's interesting. And it's like very, very well researched and really um, cool animations and graphics. And it's just a really quick way to learn about something new. Um, and it's once a week. And I would highly, highly recommend checking it out. Explained? It. Explained on Netflix. Explained. Netflix. Yeah. I yeah. love a 15 minute episode too. Netflix once a week. That's a new thing. Yeah. Yeah. They've been doing that. Their talk show format is like oh, yeah. that as well sometimes. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, well, I've got two real quick, nice and fast. One, I know we talk about Reply All every once in a while on this show, mm-hmm. but have you guys listened to the Feral Hogs episode? Is it recent? It's recent. Oh, no, I might have and missed it. It is wonderful. It's filled with twists and turns. It's political. It's empathic. It's humanistic. It's everything that that show does really well. But like literally every time I felt like, okay, well, this is the end. They've come to their conclusion of what this weird question of, feral hogs in america and what it means politically um it, you, you found the conclusion there's a new twist to it so it's based off of a uh, a tweet that went viral a couple of weeks back about a man like in response to like talking about like gun violence um tweeting about uh what a person is supposed to do when 30 to 50 feral hogs are in his yard surrounding his children which sounds totally absurd Anyway, it's a real rabbit hole. Um, but yeah, it's really great. It's like what podcasts should be doing. It's like really um, exciting and fun. And then my other one is a, a short documentary series called Art House America. It's on the Criterion channel. Um, and it's just like little mini docs on like charming art house theaters across the country. And it is wonderful. It's like sounds like exactly, exactly up Matt's up, alley. I know, I know. <laughs> um, I maybe cried in one. <laughs> oh no! Well, awesome. Um, so, Natalie, if people want to find out more about you and what you're doing, do you uh, tweet? Um, I'm 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 more of like a Instagram. Oh yeah, sure. Player. Yeah. What's your um, Instagram? Um, I'm just at Natalie Metzger. Cool. Um, yeah, and you can also find me um, at Vanishing Angle, Vanishing Angle dot com. You can get a hold of me. Awesome. Awesome. And your email address? I'm teasing. I'm teasing. You can guess it. Um, um, yeah, <laughs> if you want to find out more about the podcast, uh, we're on everything across all social media at, at Just Shoot It Pod, or you can go to our website. We'll have show notes about everything we talked about. It's just shoot it pod.com. Uh, what else? I'm on Instagram, at O Kaplan. I'm at Mr. Matt Enlo. This episode was edited by Jonathan Luna. Our producer is Madeline Rosewatt, and our webmaster is Ewan Williams. You're listening to music by the artist Jazar, which is provided by the Free Music Archive. Additional ad music by Musicbed. Thanks, Thanks for everyone. Bye.